All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lamont, and welcome to NYO Canada Online Workshops. Our YouTube live chat is open, and we will be fielding questions mainly at the end of the workshop. Um, but please uh, use the chat to post any questions, comments, and of course, chat amongst each other. Today's presenter is a consultant to the Olympic and Paralympic athletes and coaches as well as a recent inductee into the Concordia University Sports Hall of Fame. Please welcome Dr. Summer Christie. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, really happy to be back again for a second time. Um, uh, again, my background is a little bit in uh, performance psychology, but also primarily in sport. Today, we're going to talk about the Olympic audition, uh, performance on the demand arousal regulation. So specifically highlighting two key points and differences um, between what stress and anxiety is and then arousal, and then the different strategies that we can use, try out, practice, implement as far as uh, in order to prepare for an audition or really to prepare for any kind of performance, important performance event where you need to perform on demand. So. As I did last time, if you uh, were part of my last session on focus, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of an activity. But before I do that, I do would love to have questions from you. So throughout, feel free to ask, uh, feel free to shoot them out on the in the chat box and I'd, and I'd be happy to answer them. So here is our, our activity. I would like you to imagine for a moment that it's your audition day. It's today, it's right now. Are you ready to perform on demand? So we're gonna do this a little bit differently. It's a little bit easier in person, but I really want you to take the time to picture yourself in an important audition. So really imagine it, feel it, kind of imagine what it looks like around you what it smells like, what it feels like, what you might hear, what you might see or not see for that matter. So on this day, you'll be called up one at a time to stand up in front of your peers and judges to compete for the chair. However, right now, the task is a little bit different. So hopefully you're around a group and I want you to stand up and one at a time complete this task. It's to count backwards in seven out loud, starting from a random number that I choose. 
So if you can stand up, pick who goes first, if you're with somebody else, or just stand up and talk out loud. 1,081. Ready, set, go. All right. <laughs> So that activity is actually quite a bit better when I actually point you out and call you out and ask you to do that in front of your peers. I often stop before people actually have to count backwards because it's stressful and uh, it will be stressful for me too. The reason I do that activity, um, and hopefully you felt a certain to a certain extent what it was, whether you're picturing yourself in that audition, whether it was the music, the outcomes, or even the math task, whatever it was, hopefully you were feeling it. So I do that because I want you to start thinking about how the body feels and where the mind goes in these situations. So you may or may not know Sidney Crosby is a good hockey player, good Canadian hockey player, and one of the best, and uh, basically won, won the Olympics with his gold medal goal in Sydney, um, sorry, in Vancouver 2010. And I really love the quote because he says, I don't think you're human if you don't get nervous. And uh, if you remember my talk, if you were there for my talk last time, I think it's pretty normal to get nervous and part of the process. So I want you to reflect on that activity for a moment and think to yourself, what did I feel? So here I'm talking. And so maybe maybe you can even if it, if it didn't really affect you, think back to a really important audition um or performance uh, maybe in class maybe with your teachers doesn't matter what it is and i want to think about how did you feel so the sensations in your body less so your thoughts i'll ask you about that in a minute but how did you feel so often in these situations people will describe i felt like my heart started racing or it's beating out of my chest cold clammy hands now, maybe you didn't get that in this experience, but you can think back to maybe a longer experience or the, or the audition, for example, or even if your public speaking is a great example, we get cold, clammy, sweaty hands, feet too, actually. We might get rapid and shallow breathing. We might even hold our breath in these situations. We might get muscle tension. So often we get tension in our jaw, our shoulders, pretty much anywhere and you'll see, and I'm sure you know how incredibly important this is to musical performance. Now I want you to shift to what did you think? So our body reacts to stress in a certain way. Now our brain also reacts to stress in a certain way. We might've thought, had those negative thoughts, particularly with math. I, I mean, it's, um, there aren't very many people. There's some people that I, I have do this that say, hey, yeah, I was I was in the moment. I was focused on counting. But most of the time, they'll say, uh oh, what if I make a mistake? What if I fail? Particularly when you're up in front of your peers, your colleagues, your the, the judges, your coaches, whatever that might be. We go to a focus that is not appropriate. And if you were with me in the first session, it's not in our zone. It's not on what we need to do. It's kind of on all the worries, the outcomes, and the what ifs. So a little more on stress and anxiety. Well, first I wanna kind of debunk stress. <laughs> stress can be defined um, as a threat that's either real or implied to the body's ability to maintain stability, okay? To feel comfortable. So the important points I want to bring up here are the real or implied. So stress can be a real threat. Perhaps you have like a bear chasing you or a dog or something that's physically threatening to you, dangerous, or an implied threat. So there's no physical danger to you standing up, performing, or doing an audition. However, the difference between this real and implied threat is no different to the way the brain interprets it. The brain does not necessarily differentiate between a real threat and an implied threat. So that therefore can lead to the stress response. Of course, I'm getting, we're gonna talk about tools how to manage this, but whether it's real or implied, the brain sees it the same way and we were built that way. From the early days, we were built to fight to run away, to um, to save ourselves in those situations. And we have this, the, the acronym there, fight or flight, 
or freeze. They've added that on later on because sometimes in those stressful moments, we either get ready to fight or we, we actually just freeze like a deer caught in the headlights. Stage fright. So let's break it down a little bit more into what the body does. So we talked about those feelings. Now I'm going to make that a little bit more specific. What do you feel? The stress response causes, so your sympathetic nervous system. So it's 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 that ingrained um, thing we were born with, built with, to, to protect us from, say, uh, from danger. The stress response, the, what happens to the body, is our heart rate increases. So it gets faster um, because we want to pump more blood. We want to get our everything going so that we can run away. Right, we're getting the body activated to fight, fight or flee. We all same reason we're going to increase our breathing rate, so we're also going to breathe quicker. Okay, the holding the breath might be more on the the freeze side, but if we breathe quicker, shallower when we up that um, that activity and get ready to fight or run away. We get those cold hands, uh, sweaty hands and feet. Um, and also the cold uh, hands and feet as well. So peripheral body temperature. So sweaty might, I'm not sure if it's preparing you to run away, but it is a sympathetic nervous system response that you might experience when you're under pressure. And now body temperature decreases. So all the other things increase. So I get more sweaty, breathe quicker, heart rate increases, but my pot, my fingers get cold. And the reason that is, is you have blood um, arterials that go all the way up to your fingertips. So your, your blood goes all the way up to your fingertips. But in a threatening situation, you don't need your periphery. You need the blood to rush to your heart, your muscles, um, so that you can get ready to fight and run away. So it's just going away from your fingertips and your toes. And I, it might be pretty obvious, but increased muscle tension means I'm ready to fight. So this threat, real or implied, gets me ready to flight, fight. So you can imagine, I, I, the perfect example is any anybody who's studying for ex an exam, over time you don't even realize that maybe your shoulders are way up here and it's just that minimal stress, that threat that we feel, boom, we feel it up there, feel it in our jaw. And then it also alters brainwave activity. So I don't have an up or down there. I'm just gonna say that it changes your focus to be inappropriate or not what you need to be paying attention to, for example. And we'll go into more detail in that in a minute. So I'm gonna use a sport example, but I'd like you to think about um, what those physiological responses, okay? So heart rate, respiration rate, muscle tension, all those, how would too much or too little affect this type of sport performance? So this is Kyle Nissen, 2010 Vancouver Olympics. He's an athlete, an aerial skier from Canada in front of, he's from BC in fact. So in front of friends and families, last jump. All right. So if you're thinking about that performance and thinking about all the physiological responses and how they might affect that performance, for example, what's really important in this sport is how fast you take the in run. So if it needs to be the optimal speed for him to get the appropriate height so that he has enough momentum to do the twists and turns and flips that he does and so that he lands in the right spot. So, for example, if he's a little too stressed, tight, goes a little bit faster than he's expected, that speed on the end run is going to be quicker. And when you have quicker speed on that end run, you hit the jump faster, you go higher, you're tighter, so you're going to rotate quicker, and then you're not going to land in the same place. The outcome in this sport particularly can be very dangerous. You're going to crash. If he's underactivated, if there's not enough activity, if he's tired or slow or just not into it or out of it, he'll take it too slow, hit the jump with not enough speed, lower height, less rotation, crash. So that has significant impacts, but think how that relates to you and your instrument 
in your performance? How do tight muscles, how do heart racing, how does that affect how you perform? So this comes from the uh, sport literature. However, it's entirely applicable to performance and music. The actual impact of stress on performance can be, it disrupts your attention, your focus, your ability to focus. It impairs your motor performance, so your ability to, to, to move. So think about this. I mean, you probably all know this very well, but what I would say with a lot of athletes is if, you know, you can move your hands very quickly, right? Um, when you're relaxed, motor performance is excellent, fluid, whatever. But if you decide to add muscle tension to that, how quickly can you tap your fingers? It changes when you add that muscle tension. We have reduced rhythm and timing so that as much as it's important in sport, I would say it's even more important in music. Reduced reaction time and sometimes uh, too quick a reaction time if we're too excited. Decreased coordination, right? So whether if our, our hands are, are tense or body moved, like all, all of that is involved in how you play, um, but our coordination changes. We, if we have those sweaty hands, we can reduce the grip, okay? Our grip can be not as good. We might have a little slip here and there. Reduce dexterity. So if you have the cold, clammy hands, you know what it's like to move your hands when it's cold or your mouth, for example. Like, it's so different when you're cold than when you're warm and relaxed and fluid. Fatigue, difficulty concentrating, narrow or inappropriate focus can lead to choking. And as I explained in the last session, that's really suboptimal performance. And deep, like overall, it doesn't help your performance. So really think about those things and how the body's reaction to stretch, which is stress, which is normal and expected or a normal, a normal uh, human con condition, um, how it might affect your performance physically, mouth, fingers, shoulder, position, all of that. Now, I'm going to give you another sport example. Um, I, I, I'm going to look for, for a music example in this, but um, I just want you to think very, I will explain it as you go if you have not seen this before. Um, this is the New Zealand All Blacks. So they're probably the best rugby team in the world. And now rugby is not um, golf, so it requires a little bit of energy. And this is what they do. It's called the haka. It's a traditional war dance that they've done throughout, like throughout history. But they do it prior to their games to get themselves up, focused, and to often imitate, uh, intimidate the competition. So I haven't yet found a music example, but maybe you can send me in the link if you if you see any of your uh, music colleagues prep preparing like this. But the reason I share it anyways is to just question and say, is all stress negative? So physiological stress, they're moving, they're breathing quicker, they're tensing their muscles, they're they're doing all the things physiologically that that are stressful, but they're doing it because that's what prepares them to be at their best before their performance. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what is arousal. So we talked about stress as it's kind of like a one-way curve, like, or let's say it's, it's, it's negative, like too much is not helpful, okay? Arousal is a different word to describe it because it's basically just how activated our body gets, okay? So I'll explain that in, um, in an image, and this is called the inverted U hypothesis, if you were to think of performance, your ability to perform on the left side of the scale, either a weak performance or a peak performance, so low to really good, and on the bottom is your arousal level or how much of this activation you have so that breathing, like getting activated, getting tense and getting excited kind of thing. So what happens on, oops, sorry. Um, 
is our performance. Like, so if we're l like not activated enough, our performance is actually going to be quite low. So we're too calm for that optimal performance. We're going to do something that's going to get us ready to find that optimal place where we peak. So we're kind of, we're not asleep here, right? We're not going to go jump into an audition and, and fall asleep. So that goes up to peak to an optimal place. And then if we have too much of that stress, too much of that arousal, too anxious, our performance goes back down again on that curve. So it's what is optimal performance and what is that zone for you? It's important to note that everybody has a different zone. Okay. And it's very related to what you do, perhaps even the piece you're playing, I would imagine. Um, but for instance, somebody might just be optimal right in the middle. So right in between totally asleep and like crazy freaking out, let's say. And somebody else's might be more on the low end. So maybe they might be want to be more relaxed to perform better. Okay, maybe not asleep, but that's just an example of the picture. And then some others need more high energy and excitement to get to play. Right. So it's if you were to think of sport on the low end might be a golfer in the middle might be soccer. And on the right, on the high end, the very high end might be a weightlifter or an MMA fighter. Right. So the idea here is that it's different and it's unique to every person. And the idea is we really want to figure out what it is and how to get there. So how to manage arousal. And I, you know, people say how to control stress, how to control it. I'd say it's more about managing because we have to accept that anxiety is going to be normal and it's how do we work with it, not how do we control it. So let's, how do we manage that arousal, that stress, that activity? So first things first, and I'll give you five different things, just like I did with the focus. Um, and they're very similar. So number one, you need to know where that the optimal zone is for you. Where is that green spot for you? Are you in the middle? Are you on the left? Are you on the right? Like, like where is it? And does that change based on maybe the type of piece that you're playing? Okay. Consider that there's a lot more to it than just like um, one, one number. So you can do that by reflecting same way as we talked about focus, but you can do that by reflecting on your best ever and your less than best or your worst performances. So in your best ever performance, how would you describe your emotions, body sensations, feelings? So in my, in my best ever performance, was I relaxed? Was my jaw relaxed? Was I breathing properly and freely and the way I should for my instrument? Right? Um, were my hands warm? Were they cold? What did it feel like? Did I have lots of negative thoughts? Did I have wandering thoughts? Okay. What were my emotions? Were they anxious or was I calm? How did those emotions, sensations, and feelings affect my performance? So in my best ever, you know what? My jaw, my chin, and as I'm holding, say, my violin or whatever, was relaxed and comfortable and flowing, right? It felt comfortable. Did those change at different points in the day? Okay. And how did this help your performance? For example, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. We don't want to, if, if, for example, you like to be up in the high, high activation zone to perform, we can't spend the whole day there. We need to find a way to maybe manage those different levels the night before. I'm assuming we all want to sleep the night before. And when we're anxious, that's hard. So maybe in your best ever performance, you had a great sleep the night before. Did that help your performance? Likely it did. And then the same questions, but in the opposite. So in my worst performance, what were my emotions, sensations, feelings? Was I tight? Was I cold, clammy hands? Was I worried? Was I anxious? Um, how did those sensations affect my performance? If my mouth is too tight, I, I am not, uh, my embouchure is not exactly the same. It's not going to end up the same performance as you know you can in your best ever performance. How did that change in different points in the day? Perhaps I couldn't sleep. Perhaps it kept getting more and more intense as I approached 
that performance, that audition. Now, if you know one compared to the other, you have a pretty good idea of where your performance zone is. So I'll show you another um, a way, like I kind of like to describe it or a metaphor to understand is like how fast you're driving. So some of you may, may, may drive, some of you may not yet, but you've been in the car when it's idling and when it's speeding and when you feel a little bit out of control. So your arousal, you can rate on a scale of one or zero to 10. So on the lower end, like, so that zero to one, if you're driving a car, that's when you're sitting there in park and it's idling or you've got engine problems, like it's hard to go. So here I might be lethargic, tired, not motivated, that kind of thing. Then right in the middle, you might have that cruising speed. So if you're driving, what do you like? Um, when you're feeling good, cruising, optimal, optimal performance. And now some people might like to cruise a little bit faster than others, right? So it's going to be different for you. Where is it? And then finally, of course, we know what it feels like when you're about to crash. And this might have happened on your bicycle or in a car, whatever it might be. But you know when you're out of control and you feel like you might lose it. And so that's when we're up high in the tens and super anxious, right? So just know your zone, know where you want to be. And part of this is actually recognizing what zone you're in so that you can choose strategies to bring you back to that cruising speed. So strategies to get into your zone. So we're going to either want to turn it up or turn it down. So we're going to want to either step on the gas if we're idling and we're going to want to ease on the brakes if we're out of control. So how do you step on the gas? So if we think physically with all the things, even what the New Zealand All Blacks were doing, we can use physical activity to actually get yourself um, physically more aroused. So meaning um, activated, excited, ready to go. So you can, um, that's why we do warm ups in sport, but that's why you do warm ups in, in music, right? You're not coming in fresh and uh, you're not coming in um, tired and cold and all of that. So you do a little physical activity. This is, uh, again, you can use music, what you choose to listen to uh, prior, um, but that's entirely up to you. Everybody's gonna have their own piece that will either get me excited or relax me. It's gonna be able to be used in both, both ways. Um, imagery or vis visualization. So if we wanna really get excited, bring ourselves up, step on the gas, we can imagine ourselves winning. We can imagine ourselves like winning the competition, uh, feeling good, getting excited, right? Do, performing well. We can use positive self-talk so that I'm looking in the mirror and I'm telling myself I'm a lion today. I can do this. And affirmations. I would recommend getting a little post-it, sticking it on your mirror, so that it reminds you, even on the days that are tough when you're a little bit anxious and having a hard time of thinking the right things, put a little post-it on your mirror so that you see, or even on your music case, like a, your instrument case or something like that, or on the inside, just a little reminder that's meaningful to you, that's positive, um, that can bring you back in and bring you up and uh, exciting. So I'm going to actually give you a, a quick example of a video that can be found on YouTube um, called Jessica's Affirmations. And now this is a fantastic example of how to use affirmations. Um, here we go. Look, I can be a shark now. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my, I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my whole house. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do anything good. Better than anyone. Better than anyone. 
So hopefully that had you giggling, but it's actually a terrific way. Talk to yourself in the mirror, talk yourself up. I mean, we have a choice of what to think. And if we're looking in the mirror and saying, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm gonna do today, that's gonna cause stress and anxiety. But if you say, if you look at yourself in the mirror and even say it, just say, this is gonna be great, right? I like my moms, I like my Allison's, you know, like all of that. It just, it helps shift the brain into a more positive perspective. So those are a few strategies to turn it up, right? And I'd love to hear it. You know what? Throw in the chat box. If you have other suggestions too that are more specific to you, your music, your instrument, be really interested to hear that as well. So next, obviously we said, how do we step on the gas? Now, how do we ease on the brakes? So similarly, you can use the type of music you listen to. I'm going to have a big um, sort of condition at the end is that I want you to practice all of this before you actually use it in performance because I don't want you to it to interfere with your performance, right? I know you're going to be performing music, so listening to something else, up to you. Try it out in practice before you actually try it in, in, in performance. So you can listen to music that relaxes you, that calms you, okay? You can also do stretching, yoga, walks, getting outside. You can use imagery and visualization in an, the opposite way. So not visualizing something exciting, but more like visualizing something really relaxing, putting yourself on a beach, closing your eyes, imagining all is well and you feel good and you're confident. Using meditation and, and sleep. And so sleep primarily is that getting into the right zone the night before. Um, how do you fall asleep? How can we? There's a few apps that um, are terrific that you can download and sometimes have a, a, a free subscription or a, a limit to what is free. Um, so Calm and Headspace are good apps for meditation and sleep stories. And Paziz, if, if that's how you say it, is a great one for sleep as well. So you can just pop that on, listen to a guided meditation, um, or even like this might just be the sound of rain and, and a sleep story, which is basically something boring enough that you do fall asleep to it. Um, but it's it keeps enough of your attention that you're not wandering off worrying or thinking about other things. Breathing and muscle relaxation. I'm going to come back to that uh, in the next slide because we're going to go into more detail, but we can use breathing and muscle relaxation. And then we can also use cognitive strategies, which I'll come back to in other slides as well, reframing perspective and self-talk. So ease on the brakes, breathing and progressive muscular relaxation. So this is, a, this is in large part the area that I research and that I use with um, athletes and with performers. What I do know from the research is that abdominal breathing at six breaths per minute, which is approximately one's resonant frequency, shuts off that sympathetic nervous system stress response, okay? And kicks in a parasympathetic relaxation response. And so it's key. Now, again, I'm gonna highlight that this is, I'm not changing the way you breathe for your performance. That is totally up to you and what you've learned and what you do. This is a tool that you can use at night, you can use before, Okay, to try and see how it can help you with that relaxation. But I am not changing anything about how you breathe when you're playing. So um, what you can do is you can download an app and you would set it to six breaths per minute um, and breathe to that pace. So it might be a sound, you might see a visual. If you have an Apple Watch, there's a breath pacer that'll just you know show this little flower opening and closing. Uh, you can use that. And so you inhale and exhale for the count of six. So inhale for the count of four, exhale for the count of six. Six breaths per minute. So if you can set your app to be that ratio, that's even better. So the research certainly says six breaths per minute um, helps kick in that relaxation response. The ratio, four to six. We have said there is no research that says exactly what it should be. If you prefer a five to five, or if you like a four hold five, you know, that's that's gonna be up to you. We like it because your heart rate increases as you inhale and it decreases as you exhale. So the exhalation part, which is your parasympathetic relaxation, we wanna extend that phase. So that is what I would recommend. The important part is the abdominal breathing. So if you're doing this at night before bed, you lie on your back, you put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly, 
And really when you're breathing, when you breathe in, it's only that your belly that is expanding and rising. This hand on your chest stays relatively still. And when you breathe out, it falls right back down. So practice takes perfect. You can't just expect to use six breaths per minute and all of a sudden it work and, and help your um, anxiety or reduce your stress in the moment. That's super critical. Uh, but if you practice it over time, you will get used to that feeling and you will be able to do it. So doing it regularly will help you with the skill to be able to do it in the moment. So for example, if I'm super anxious prior to my performance, what I can probably do is stop, maybe talk to myself, use a cognitive strategy, but also one breath relaxation. So if I'm so good at knowing what that, that feeling is, then I can just prior to when I'm getting ready and I'm feeling myself too much, I can just go and let it out and actually feel my body relax. The other important one physiologically is progressive muscular relaxation. So this is something you can do at night and practice or daily and practice and implement in the moment, okay? And again, not in performance, maybe prior to finding your zone, okay? So progressive muscular relaxation is very simple and you can do it while you're doing your abdominal breathing. So if you're doing it at night, what you do is you do ab abdominal breathing, but then what you, you wanna go from your feet all the way to your face and you wanna tense and then relax each muscle group. So you'd start with your feet, you'd tense your feet, you'd relax your feet, calves, um, thighs, quads, bum, um, abdomen, chest, arms, shoulder, jaw, face, even when you end up where you're squishing your entire face, right? And then tensing it, but then letting it go and really feeling that let go. When you get good at this, then I'd say in the prior to, if you're feeling like, oh, my, my jaw is really tight and then that is not gonna help me perform, right? So I can just sort of um, prior to this, as I'm warming up and finding my zone, I can just do a scan, okay? I can just say, is it relaxed? Is it at the right place? Are my shoulders where they need to be? So a body scan is just being aware, but another tool too is if you're not sure if you're holding tension, as I mentioned before, you might be studying or practicing and by the end of the day, you end up like this and you didn't even know it. I would include in a body scan that you can simply, if you're not sure, you just squeeze it up and let it go. And then let it go to a place where you know is gonna be optimal for your performance. If we have time at the end, I'll run you through one of those. The next one is gonna be another ease on the brakes, reframing the situation. So this is a cognitive strategy and it's just how we how we talk to ourselves to slow it down, okay? So really what we wanna do is in this sense, transform our weaknesses into our strengths. We're not gonna downplay any initial thoughts. So you might be walking into um, a competition where you know who you're up against, let's say. And you know that they're, they have strengths in certain areas. So you might be really worried about what they're good at. So don't downplay it. Don't say, don't think about it, right? Say, I know they're really good at this, but how can you reframe that? You can say, well, I'm actually really good at this. This is how I can use it to my advantage, right? So it's just reframing the situation. The next one is having a little perspective. Um, and this goes with the, the, the threat and how we describe stress. This is the Chinese um, characters for the word crisis, Y Chi. Now, together it means crisis, but taken separately, each character means something different. One means danger, and the other means opportunity. So in every threatening situation or crisis situation, you can see the danger, but also the opportunity in it. So choose that. So yes, I'm fearful. Yes, this is a little bit scary, but you know what? It's such an opportunity to go out there and see what I can do and perform at my best. And another one, we all get those butterflies. So acknowledge it. This is a great quote from Terry Orlick. It's the challenge is really not to get rid of the butterflies, but to let them fly in formation. So use them, use them to your advantage. How can you use that to help you perform? I've got these nerves, 
either, oh no, that means I'm nervous, I'm not gonna play well, or Whew, that means I'm ready, here we go, get goosebumps. We talked about self-talk a little bit when we were talking about focus, so what I'll share with you now is a little video of a girl skiing, um, going through a little out loud self-talk, okay? So see what you can pick up from here that might be helpful and useful for you. I'll be fine. Come on. I'll do it. Well, here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Keep it straight, you'll be fine. Keep okay. Going straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. That's a fine. Bigger 20. Go ahead. You got <laughs> I got it. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. <laughs> at the top of the first time for each yeah. year. That's the only thing. It's so fun. Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! So hopefully you had another little giggle at that one. But what I love about this is she had never done this before. So something to be really fearful of. And it is dangerous, right? She did it. She acknowledged. She looked for information from her coaches. Is it steeper? Do I go faster? What I like too is she was scared. You could hear it in her voice. You could see that. But she talked herself through it. She talked. She asked questions. She reminded herself that she could. You know, she was able to really get herself to a point where where she she just at the end she took that deep. It's just a bigger this. It's okay. Um, and she took this deep breath and said, here I go. And then she went. Um, and of course, after, like the elation that she has from being able to do that is just sp spectacular, right? So you can use self-talk, outward talk, talk, ask, talk to your friends, whatever that might be, to sort of like calm yourself in this situation and or to talk yourself up. Here are, and, and again, the slides will be available to you afterwards, so you don't have to copy down these uh, these apps. Currently, right now, there's actually, because of the COVID situation, there are a lot of free resources um, that you may want to explore for meditation and sleep. So Headspace and Calm both have free resources right now. Breathing Pacers, I have a couple of links from um, iTunes that might be helpful and different yoga. So yoga based on affirmation. So you can do a 10 minute yoga in the morning to relax, calm, and to have an affirmation that you will follow and think about for the rest of the day. Number three, um, and we'll get, we're almost done here. Um, create your arousal regulation plan. So we created a focus plan and a distraction control plan in the first time. And here's your arousal regulation plan. And what you want to do is you want to, on the left side, list out all the important times leading up to an important event. Okay, so to your audition, to your Olympic audition. So the night before, pre-performance, the morning of, maybe your warm up, like when you arrive, your warm up. You can make it as as detailed as you want with your times. Immediately prior to when you're performing, or each excerpt during. Okay, and between, right? If you're playing more than one piece, you're gonna have time in between. So with that, you wanna decide what zone you wanna be in. So the night before, likely you wanna sleep. Morning of, you wanna be relaxed. 
pre-performance warm-up, I'm getting to my optimal level, right? And then during, I want to be at my optimal level. And maybe between, I want to be able to relax a little bit. And I'm just saying that's as, as an average, everybody's going to be different. And that's why it's up to you to decide what your zone is during those times. And I want you to describe it. So the night before, it's a zero to one. I want to feel relaxed. I want to fall asleep easy. I want to not be overthinking, okay? Um, same thing with all the other parts. Like, describe what that feels like, what that looks like. Is your heart racing? Is your muscle tense? My muscles are relaxed. So kind of be as descriptive as you can. And then, how will I get there? So that's the most important part. And you can go back to all those strategies. So the night before, I want to feel relaxed so I can go to sleep. So what I'm going to do is some abdominal breathing and um, progressive muscular relaxation. And you know what? Perhaps even listen to a sleep story um, to help me fall asleep. Okay. So exactly what you're going to do um, at each one of these times. So it's important that you start writing this plan now because we want to put it into practice practice before we put it into performance okay it's absolutely essential that you practice it before you get to the stage especially when we're talking about skills like cognitive strategies what you're thinking how you're breathing okay how that that's really important to musical performance so you really need to know how that affects you and how you can use it okay so write it out and then we'll talk about that but you're going to de debrief it after so the next one is practice those strategies. You've listed it out. You've said what you want to do. So do basic practice. So this means at night when you're trying to sleep every night, maybe do six minutes of breathing and re progressive muscular relaxation. Again, you didn't learn how to play your instrument in one day. You can't effectively use breathing, relaxation, or any of these skills if you just try it once when you're under pressure. Okay. It takes practice make some time for it, make some space for it. Two, then practice under pressure, okay? And I don't mean performance yet, I mean under pressure. So simulate performance so that you know how these skills, these tools will affect you. If they're helpful, if they're not, if they interfere, okay, with how you're, you know, might need to breathe, for example, want you to practice, like practice in general, build the skill, practice under pressure. So again, the highlight is it's really important to practice and implement and debrief these skills um, in practice and under pressure before you implement in an important event like an audition, okay? And then finally, debrief it, okay? So you've written your arousal plan, you've practiced it, you've practiced under pressure, debrief that plan, you know, was, breathing the night before was that helpful did it what went well and why so that breathing or this sleep story was great for the night before what was or what what was what could be better you know what maybe I should go to bed a little bit earlier okay next how do I improve that set a, a timer right uh, anything on my phone that I can do it Okay, again, keep it simple performance based be objective don't judge if you can't fall asleep I would love for you to say, not be, I can't fall asleep. Oh no, what's wrong? I like, because that's going to just keep you asleep, right? Uh, keep you awake and keep you worried. If you're objective, you can use a little bit of a mindfulness approach. And mindfulness simply means acknowledging and allowing it to happen. So instead of at night going, oh my God, I can't sleep. I'm not going to get enough time. I, I'm not sleeping. I'm not sleeping. You could say, okay, it's a little bit of a struggle to be falling asleep right now. What I can do is I can think about my breathing, do some relaxation and see if that works. Okay. And again, more positives than negatives, as always, as I like to uh, remind people who are high performers that uh, you do do a lot that is great. And sometimes we focus on the negative instead of the positive. All right. So that would be... Um, the uh, the end of uh, our session and i really hope that we have some questions this time yeah we'll give it another uh, couple seconds just for the latency and, and we'll see if some questions come in summer yeah no problem <laughs> It's easier when I'm face to face because I'm going to point you out and ask you, how, what do you think? What does it do? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, I was, I was right there with you. And, and, um, when you asked us to count down from what 1000 and what 81. was it, 80, 81 from seven and the music was going, I was like, Oh no, I, I, I immediately felt stressed and, uh, Oh, not good. in the zone, for sure. <laughs> well, not good, but it's good because I didn't know how it would work in this type of a platform. But I mean, like you can think of just how much that does relate to those important moments, right? Like mm -hmm. you you won't have sound as a distraction per se. I would I'd imagine your environment set up for that. <laughs> uh, in sports, they do, but maybe a timer, right? A countdown, a pressure, an outcome, all those things factor into like that fight, flight, or freeze, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes, yeah. especially with math, I've had some really interesting answers. Usually I grab the group and and get somebody, I pull somebody out and say, you're gonna be first. And I stand them up in front of everybody. And once I did that with like an Olympic uh, rugby player, a guy uh, who strong, big, whatever. And after I said, well, what were you thinking? Or what did you think? And he said, oh my God, I was just hoping somebody would pull the fire alarm so that I could run out of here. <laughs> Like literally. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> honestly, absolutely. He's like, my hands are sweating. I couldn't do it. Like he's like, mm -hmm. he totally froze well or was ready to like flee, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, you know, not knowing the number, it, you know, it's a surprise. And you're like, oh no, like how do I handle that surprise? And that happens in performances sometimes. Yeah. Something comes out that you have no idea and it's a surprise, it's a noise, a mistake that you normally don't make. You yeah. know, and it's exactly those those reactions. Right. Um, I found it really interesting because I've been in this situation many of time, the cold hands. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, man, it's cold in here. What's going on? <laughs> you know, I, and I, 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 would, I would I remember myself thinking I was calm or feeling calm yeah. and yeah. being really confused. I'm like, like someone needs to turn on the heat or something. But, yeah. you know, like uh, looking at, at what you laid out, you know, it's probably I was still really stressed and nervous and yeah. it, it was the hall was probably fine yeah. it's just my reaction still perhaps sometimes it is the environment that's cold yeah. like that's a really good opportunity that's why i always say like reflect and debrief these things because the more you think about them the more you kind of say well maybe i was more nervous i was telling myself i wasn't but i actually felt it mm -hmm. um, like i work a lot with biofeedback so some something you can do, you can buy a, like a cheap thermometer <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and you basically hold it between your fingertips, like more of a, like a, an, like I have a stress thermometer. Anyways, you hold it between your fingertips, see what the temperature is on your hands and then practice breathing and see if you can raise the temperature of your hands. Whoa. Yeah. So, and this is the biofeedback work I do. So basically what you're doing is you're getting um, feedback on what your physiology is doing. So you could do the same thing with this, like, oh, is my mm -hmm. heart racing? And then you mm -hmm. can say, okay, I can, I feel it racing. I can slow it down, right? Slow same down. thing with this, but you can use like a little thermometer and say, well, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Practice breathing and I, it will go back up. You have that's amazing. It, it kind of gives you a little bit of confidence knowing that those tools like breathing can can shift um, your physiology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And it's those unknowns sometimes, you know, where you're like, is it cold in here or is it me? You yep. know, but if 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 you thermometer trick a few times and, and you you know that it, the space you're in is controlled, then that gives you the confidence saying, okay, it's me. Yeah. I, I can I can work on the breathing. That's yeah. really great, really great advice. It. And I, and well, again, I say, and um, like with music, it is so essential that you breathe and your posture and all things are related to music. So keep in mind, mm -hmm. the skills, how I talk about them are to relax and to find the right zone, maybe not to be doing, to change anything about how you perform. Amazing. All like right. Don't uh, deep breath in the middle of your excerpt. So yeah, maybe not then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One moment. I'm going to debrief this whole thing. If you guys can just give me a moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that was that was really great, um, Summer. Thank you so much for being with us this week. Um, I certainly learned a lot, um, and I know um, our orchestra and viewers. I think they're equally taking just as much out of this. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank.